Sometimes you're flush and sometimes you're bust. And when you're up, it's never as good as it seems. And when you're down, you never think you're going to be up again. But life goes on. Remember that. Money isn't real, George. It doesn't matter. It only seems like it does. It's on. Here we go. Another episode of Staying in Trouble. Hard at you, man. Let's go. I'm at it. I'm Eric. Hey, dude, it's been a while, man. It's been We've a been, day or two. It's a, more than a day or two. We'll, we'll talk it's been about, a hot minute, man. It's been a hot minute. We'll talk about that. We'll talk about it on the next episode why right. it's been a little bit. You know, <laughs> it's going to be a good a good one because people are going to want to know why. So, Right on, man. We've got a, we've got a huge celebrity in the house huge right now. Huge one, man. I've been excited. I've been excited, dude. You, you, you were over in the island. I was at the island. Dude, you stepped in. I did. With with the win. Yeah, yeah, dude, we did good. How was that? Oh, I'm sorry, dude. We have Eric Nixick in the studio, man. Yes, sir. The great trainer, man. Stepped in for uh, Gordon, right? Yeah, Jared Gordon. And, yeah. uh, man, he put it down. He did. Yeah, he was. Uh, he had a little bit of a struggle, you know, like getting getting everything everything lined up for him. And uh, it was the very last minute, you know. He had uh, Coach Henry Hooft and, and the team out there at Stanford MMA and they all pop for COVID. So, you know, he called me last minute. Um, I'm really good friends with his manager. Never oh, okay. trained Jared in, once in my life. We've always been good friends. And uh, he goes, hey, coach, I need I need a hand, dude. I'm going to be out there with the uh, same fight as Danny Gay's on. Do you think you can corner me? And I was like, man, I got you. No problem. And I can just hear the distress in his voice. Like he had been through a lot and a lot was going on in his so life. So they were going to cancel the fight. It was going to be over. Yeah, it was. they were going to cancel the fight or I think postpone and move it. And – Look, man, you, you put so much in, especially during the pandemic, and, and a lot of guys have been training hard and, and getting that work in. And, you know, he was like, man, I, 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 know, I know what I'm capable of. You know what I'm capable of. I feel comfortable with you being there. I just need a good warm-up, good solid corner advice. I said, man, I got you. No problem. And it was, it was Fantastic. fun. Fantastic. Yeah, that that, that's awesome, yeah. man. That's awesome. Anyways, yeah, dude. Here, yeah. man. We finally, well, I mean, between the island, between us being out, you know, it's been a long minute trying to get Eric in here. Uh, you know, some of the things I want to talk to Eric about is, you know, you're on the biggest stage. UFC was one of the first, you know, first sports back after the pandemic. So I'm sure everyone's peppering you with questions. Like, you're just a grinder. Mm. And you are you talk about, you know, these athletes being in pandemic and grinding it out and, and hammering. You know, MMA is a, is a singular solo sport, right? There's no tag teams. Like, no, tag, I'm out, right? right? And, and so... That actually would be kind of fun. <laughs> yeah. Why don't they do that? Yeah, that they do it in fun. Russia. I'm sure. Do they? they? Oh yeah, for sure. Yeah, <laughs> Russian dudes I'm are crazy. sorry, dude. That just that just hit my mind. <laughs> that, yeah. Oh, yeah. that would be badass, they, dude. They do some crazy stuff in Russia. <laughs> that would be awesome. So, Eric, you're born and raised here in Vegas. How do you go from being here in Vegas to being on the biggest stage? Give us a little rundown. You know, um, I think just persistency and, and love in the grind. There's something. You know, my dad always had a funny saying to me. He's like, hey, either marry money or find a job that's not a job for you that you just love. You know, and I think I just became fortunate to where growing up and kind of finding trouble and getting in fights and doing all those things. And it's it's great to see like people that I grew up with that kind of had shared this stage with me in a, in a sense to where now they see me and they're like, man, I'm, I'm so glad you found your passion. And we never thought that all the fighting you would get into as a kid would pay <laughs> off for you in the future. And sure as shit as it did, man, you know, so I think that was really it for me. It was just it's just finding something that I love to do and a passion for the sport and I kind of fell into it. Well, I mean, let's so. Let's talk about what gym you're at. Give us a little rundown of what gym you're at and how you ended up there. Because you've been there for a while now. Yeah, for sure. I'm at Extreme Couture Mixed Martial Arts. Um, I've been there since day one. Started off in 2007 with Randy Couture. Randy was getting ready to fight Tim Sylvia. He had just opened the gym, but not to the public. He had opened the gym for himself and a few select training partners. And did, I just stumbled so how across. So how did you meet Randy? I walked into the gym because I knew he was opening the gym. I didn't know when it was going to open. And I walked in, and it was just a very small, select few guys, Mike Pyle, Jay Heron. Um, Randy had some training partners that he was working with at the time. And I, I can I can still see the day. Like, I remember it being cold out. It was like a January. These dudes uh, were pumping like a – looked like an F-16 engine, you know, and they were just <laughs> pumping like carbon monoxide. I'm like, you know, guys, this isn't, this isn't healthy. You know, I remember just walking yeah. in thinking like, man, this is the Hall of Famer. Like, this is the guy. 
And, um, you know, hey, guys, what's going on? Uh, you know, I played football. I really don't have a background, but I knew you were open the gym soon. And he said, hey, look, we're not open yet. But uh, if you'd like to come in and start training with us, we'd love to have you in as, as an as a athlete, as a body. Were you bartending still? or what? I was bartending, and I was still in school. I was going to paramedic school. So I just needed really, for me, I felt like I needed to find – something that I was missing with um, my team, like a camaraderie. Yeah. I missed the most out of football. I missed the games. I missed all the competition, of course, but I really missed the guys. I missed the team aspect. And right away, the moment I walked into the string couture, I felt that. I felt that right away. And then Mike Pyle brought me in. I got to train that day. He just beat the crap out of me. And that was really <laughs> it, man. I was, I was cutting my teeth with some of the baddest dudes on the planet. And, and a lot of guys I, I didn't know know. Right. I didn't know Mike Pyle at the time, but – come to find out you know he was one of the best guys in mma and he wasn't fighting in the ufc at the time he's fighting like wc ifl the kind of the smaller shows yeah but really really just beat the crap out of me and i was like man i hadn't had this like this you know and this is kind of where i wanted to be i wanted to be with guys that were better than me that were going to push me um you know, none of them were big partiers. They were all very set on becoming the best mixed martial artists they can be. And I think that was it for me right away. I never left. I've never left that gym, man. I've, I've never I've trained at other places. You know, I've gone and done other things uh, in other spots. But Extreme Couture has always been my home, and it's been because of Randy. That's, That's awesome, awesome, man. Yeah. yeah. So, so growing up here, you went to Green Valley High School. Sir. So. You, you didn't fight. You just wrestled in high school. You played football in high school. What'd yeah, you do? Yeah, I, I played football. Um, you know, I started, uh, I got brought up to varsity as a 14-year-old. I was on varsity uh, the year, I think we got beat by Clark. Clark won state that year. The next year, as a sophomore, I started off on JV, got brought back up to varsity, and that was it. I was on varsity ever since. Um, my sophomore year, I went to go wrestle with Coach Steen. And I was literally in the wrestling room and Larry Thomas walked in the wrestling room, saw me wrestling and said, get the fuck out of there. You're not wrestling. really. Yeah. <laughs> I wanted to wrestle. And, and Mike McAvoy, he was, um, an unbelievable wrestler at green Valley. He'd always like, Hey man, you should really start wrestling. It'd be good for you. And Larry just had a, Larry Thomas had a big, not problem with two sports athletes. He just figured that skill position guys were year round quarterbacks, for receivers. Sure. And, um, I didn't have a problem with it. I understood where he was coming from. We were more of a program rather than like, just like playing football. You know, we were a program. Yeah. That program was year round and same went for baseball, you know, Chad Hermanson, Nick day, like all these guys, they weren't really allowed to play football either. They were, you know, one sport guys with coach fairless. Sometimes guys got to go either way. That was AC Smith. AC got to play a little football, but it was funny because AC, when he would play, f play baseball, he would come to football late and he had to pay the price. Like he wasn't starting right away, mm -hmm. you know? And I, I just, I knew where I, I knew I could get a scholarship in football and that's what Larry wanted. So that's what I did. As much as I love wrestling and the mixed martial arts side, I just stuck with my football in, in, in high school. So all your fights were extracurricular. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, b before the show, we were talking a little bit about how uh, your baseball friends would bring you in. And uh, man, you're going to throw some people on the bus. Oh, I am. Them all the bus. I I'll am. call them all out right now. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> I'll well, call them all out because I, and I heard the story from both sides and I, I thought the basic kids would be like, Oh no, you know, we, you know, we, no, we didn't go down. Oh no, the basic kids are like, oh yeah, Eric came over, it, and uh, yeah, it went down really fast. Yeah, we scrapped, man. <laughs> yeah, so, we got a lot of fights. <laughs> but but you know what? Like like we were saying before the show, that's what made high school fun for me. It is a, a little bit of the rival, for sure. You know, uh, Boulder City was a rival for us. Mm -hmm. We were still playing them. I, I I think towards my senior year, we stopped playing them because. Every year they would have a graduating class and their numbers would get too low. And then they went to like what single A or double A or whatever yeah, double, it was. Double A. And then we didn't play them. And then they would have enough numbers and then we would play them. But I just remember having them as a big rival. Even when my mm -hmm. dad went to basic, it was a big rival, mm -hmm. you know? But then Green Valley comes around what my freshman year mm -hmm. what 92 93 i think they opened. 93, 93, 93 was yeah 93 was their first graduating class mm -hmm. yeah so those so are, they, those so, are the, probably the be the best class at green valley so all of a sudden henderson gets a second high school right and that was huge man mm -hmm. and then you got we always thought correct me if i'm wrong but they were handpicking all these elite athletes from all these different other schools to make their school right and man we couldn't beat them so what was the word like i think the way we became a magnet school 
If is I that remember, how it works? I remember, I, if I remember correctly, that was the term. So what it was was, um, you know, he's, he basically became my older brother. We, we, we adopted him, Jason Palmaris. He lived um, in the Rancho District. Mm -hmm. But because of certain uh, classes that Green Valley offered, you were allowed to elect to go to, to, go to Green Valley yes. because of the classes. Okay. Yeah. So, um, you know, Wade Perkins, Don McCall, uh, Eric McCauley, all these athletes that came in, yeah. man, it was it was they were zoned for Rancho. They'd bus in, and right away we were contenders. Oh, yeah, you yeah, know? right away we were playing, man. We, I don't <laughs> think, I I don't remember ever beating you guys. <laughs> I don't think we did. Uh, I don't remember it either. Yeah, <laughs> Not how long we were there for sure. No, my, it, so it was tough. And you were there during the asbestos years. My wife was there too, mm -hmm. and that the asbestos years. That's a good mm -hmm. way of terming it, isn't it? Because that's yeah. a that's a weird mix too. You know, we're in a weird time right now with pandemic. But I mean, the story you guys have of hey, we went to school. You know, you you guys went in the morning, and then the basic kids showed up in the afternoon. Yep. I mean, that's a weird dynamic for when sure. you've got. And, and I think that actually probably helped you out actually in the grand scheme of things because. You know, a lot of the stories I heard is those basic boys were were poaching on the Green Valley girls, mm -hmm. <laughs> and you know, they t they shot their shots. Yeah, <laughs> you know, they shot their shots, and and the boys are like, "Hey, Eric, can you uh, help us?" Oh, and I'm yeah. like, "Yeah, they're calling I, you." <laughs> yeah, and they were like, and I was thinking about this story, and I'm like, "Man, you know what's crazy about that is, you know, the fact that you're calling someone in." to handle the business <laughs> and you know he's not even it's not even his girls that have the problem it's your <laughs> girls it's your yeah. girls yeah. yeah yeah and uh they're like yeah but he was definitely the man to you know it, he definitely want him in your corner and i'm like yeah that's what everyone says right now that's yeah, right. what he does yeah, professionally yeah, like yeah, literally exactly. But that's exactly what jaron gordon did right yeah, yeah. Exactly. i need you in my corner <laughs> calling the wolf yeah, yeah right <laughs> so Dude, that's awesome, man. So, so then you went to Reno, went right? Went to Reno, yeah. And, went to Reno, and you did all four years there, or you played ball there I, all I did four not. years. The idea was the, was to get up there and play some football, and uh, yeah. I think for me, um, it was it was the idea was to get in, get the red shirt, start lifting weights, stay in the program, learn the program, um, and then I just I, I just got in a lot of trouble just found trouble mm -hmm. more than I found, uh, the education side more than I found, you know, staying in the, in the football element. It was almost kind of like idle hands, you know, it's like, all right, no one's looking down on me right now. The pressure of, of always being with living at home with my old man was never pressure, but it was always regimented, right? We mm -hmm. knew it was time for football. My uncle was always on me. You know, I had two uncles that were, uh, one was the Dean, one was the D, uh, linebackers coach and my dad was a D coordinator and you get out of that element. And for, for me, it was almost just kind of, you just got lackadaisical, you know? Yeah. And all I really did was I partied, I fought dudes, I drank, I woke up late and then we did it all over again. And then, you know, I would hit, I would hit the weights with the team. That was really it. And then, uh, uh, coach Alt was the defense or excuse me, athletic director at the time. Tisdale was the coach. And, you know, it just, for me, I think, you know, Alt sat me down once and was like, Hey man, if this is what you want to do, you want to play ball, you got to get your shit straight. And, you know, I got in a big, big fight in the dorms got me kicked out of school. Um, I remember coming back, I got thrown in jail for a couple nights. My old man drove up or flew up. Uh, he, he bailed me out of jail and he's like, Hey, you know, I think we need to come home and reassess and, uh, looked at some options that I had that were still scholarships on the table. And it was Dixie junior college and, uh, Dixie was winning national championships. It was a small school. Mm -hmm. Um, I think it slowed everything down for me and I was really able to go focus in on football and I think that's probably what I should have done in the beginning. I should have gone to a small, smaller school because I graduated high school at 17. You know, I, I played three years of varsity young. Really, I was I was well behind as as an, at my age. Um, and I started growing into my body. I started understanding the athlete that I that I was. And that's what happened at Dixie. And I was glad I got to go there. And I, got, I was glad I got to play there. And, um, you know, we, we, we played for back to back national championships. And it was good for me. And that was kind of the, the closure for me for football was the end of that was was finishing up at Dixie and, and being, you know, being the athlete that I thought I could be. Dude, that's amazing. I think that happens to a lot of young people. They get out of high school and then they get thrown into college yeah. and they're all on their own. Man. All on their and, own. and then it's like, here, here's some responsibility, but 
holy cow, here's all this fun stuff. Yeah. yeah. And then you mix the girls and the and and the party life and everything else, and no one's watching over you. No one's checking in on you. Yeah. Yeah. And sometimes it it's a lot. It was it, it was too much for especially me. Especially at what seventeen? Yeah, I was seventeen. Ooh. Um, and then I turned eighteen that September. And, you know, I, you know, I went to Wisconsin, I went to Washington and all these other schools, U of A and, and, you know, where did I want to play? Where do I want to be? And for some reason why I wanted to kind of, I wanted to get back at UNLV for not recruiting local kids. You know, UNLV Mm -hmm. always wanted to offer local kids or never offer local kids scholarships because they they were going to keep those for out of state kids and keep us cheap with in-state tuition. They can make up for that with, um, you know, giving them books and here and there, but it was a slap in the face, you know, John Denton went there and John Denton was, was our quarterback. He was the guy breaking all the records at UNLV. And I thought, man, this is a great way for us to build this school, this program where we're born and raised at UNLV and Horton just had a different idea. Well, when, when that, when Horton left and a lot of guys, uh, Brian White went to Wisconsin, Brian White was, uh, the, in the Jim strong era. He started recruiting us, Eddie Hartwell from, from Cheyenne. He knew that Vegas was a hot spot and not getting recruited cor- correctly. You know, Mike Riley started taking kids up to Oregon state, Stephen Jackson. Yeah. They didn't offer Stephen Jackson a full ride, man. Like, that, like isn't that, that crazy? That just blows your mind. Yeah. Think of that, man. Like that guy was, you know, a freaking stud. Yeah. And and that was it for us. So I was like, you know, I wanted to get back at that school that, that, that didn't want to take the local kids. Yeah. You know, we wanted to stay there and, and, and make that school good. And they didn't, they didn't want yeah. us, you know? So, but yeah, that was it, man. I, I thought Reno was the best fit for me at the time and, you know, got getting out of school and not really having mom and dad on top of you and, yeah, and yeah. all that stuff. Plus it was Reno. Plus it was Reno. <laughs> exactly. You know, there wasn't a whole lot to do there. And there's no, not. There's. Bu- <laughs> I don't think there's a lot to do there there's, now. Yeah, there's yeah. bums everywhere. Uh, yeah. No, I'm very familiar with downtown Reno. So. <laughs> yeah. Are you? Yeah. <laughs> For sure. A lot of my family is from Reno and lives oh, in yeah? Reno. Oh, yeah. So oh, now I-, I go up there all the time and I'm like, man. I didn't miss this last time. Don't miss it now. I thought at all. I thought that was going to come with some wild stories or something. Uh, yeah, we try to we try to get rid of a couch in downtown Reno, yeah. and <laughs> and it turned into like a rain shelter. And like now, every year we go by it, and it's like we take a picture. <laughs> it's still there. It's still there. That's awesome. So we try to take it to a donation place. It was like a brand new couch, and they're like, we don't take couches. And we're like, uh, okay. So my cousin and I just wheel it around the corner behind this pizza parlor. And dude, it's it's been there for like three years straight. Oh man. And I'm yeah. like, you know, it's part of the no, it's part of the ambiance of downtown Reno. That was daily. It was like, what can we come up with of like what prank or what can we fuck up or what can we do to like piss off this fraternity? Yeah. And then like draw them outside and then scrap. You know? like, <laughs> it was and that was it. Like I never wanted to rush a fraternity. It was like, oh, what can we do to fuck these guys up or fuck with them? Yeah. You know, like SAE had like these big old like cement lions. You know, and, and I'm like, all right, here's what we're going to do. We're going to take these lions. We're going to load them on the back of this truck. And then we're going to swim them out to this island at Manzanita Lake. <laughs> right? Like yeah. right in the middle of like where, where the cafeteria was. Yeah. And I'm like, all right, this sounds like a great idea. Yeah, that's a great and idea. These, and these lions weighed like 1,200 pounds. <laughs> <laughs> right sure as shit we like it, was, it takes four of us and we load these things up and now we're swimming them across a lake what? Where, like half of us are drowning trying to wow get these things. yeah and we did we, we, we ended up dropping one to the bottom of the lake and we got actually got one yeah. across hey. you know hey one out of two, one two not bad spray painted this thing with like lawn like the lawn spray so it was like bright you know, oh bright nice up. so i remember going to the uh to go eat the next day and seeing like these pledges having to swim across <laughs> the <lake. laughs> to go take these things out it took like 10 of them to get the thing off and swim it across. You so, know, we come up with this stupid stuff. Adam, do you know where Fraternity Row is in Reno? No, I do okay, not. Okay, so you got you got Ghetto Reno, and then um, right across the freeway, all wait, those- Wait, there's a good side of Reno? Nah. <laughs> yeah, Carson City. Carson City. That's where they film Reno 911. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, right. And then right across the freeway, all these like row houses are are fraternity houses. Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, been. that's that, you know, if anything was done right, it's like in theory, that's why UNR should be great because it's in downtown. It's got these row houses. You got great parks. You got like n- decent houses on the, uh, like just above the school. Like it, it's made for a nice community. Unfortunately, it's Reno. Mm. And so, like, the armpit is still an armpit. Like, no matter how you trim it, 
it's still an yeah. armpit. You can so. only polish a turd. Hey, if so we have any yet. listeners in Reno, <laughs> hang on, man. This is really a good show, man. We don't mean to shit bag on your on your town, man. <laughs> you always have Tahoe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> you, you got Tahoe, Reno, yeah. <laughs> and it's not that hot up there. Yeah, exactly. That's right. Look, we're not going to bring up Fernley. We're not going to bring up Silver Springs. <laughs> yeah, right. We're not going to bring up Cold Springs. So, well, dude, that's awesome. So, and, and so then you come back home. You're done with college. Yeah. What's next? Uh, I, I start taking, I start, I start understanding a little bit of accountability, right? I start yeah. becoming a, an adult and trying to figure out like, okay, man, what do I want to do with my life? Um, again, the, the military started to kind of feel like where, where I wanted to be. Um, I started talking to my dad about like, Hey, maybe, maybe I jump in. I want to maybe be a Navy SEAL. I want to get into some special forces stuff. And you know, and then nine 11 happens and uh-huh. it's like, man, like, you know, I, I don't, I don't know if this is what I want, not necessarily what I, what I want my son to do, but he's like, son, listen, man, they're going to send you across the ocean to go fight, fight in a war that might not be, you know, what you, what for you. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and then the fire department was something I always thought would, would be good for me give back to my community again, kind of that paramilitary mentality, working with a team, somebody, you know, trying to work to, together to achieve a common goal. And that's where I felt I've, I fit in the best. And I started really pushing towards the fire department. Um, I did really, really well on all my tests. I scored 98 on the city and North Las Vegas test. I got hired by both departments. Um, I went to backgrounds and I talked to my chief about, um, you passed the physicals. I did. I did. Yeah. <laughs> fortunate, fortunate I passed the physicals. Um, I talked to my chief about the fight that I got in Reno that got, got me kicked out of school. And he's like, hey, man, that was a while back. Uh, I think you're going to be okay. You know, just don't lie. and Don't say something false on your backgrounds. And I didn't. You know, I, I was very truthful in that. And unfortunately, they dropped me. You know, they said, hey, man, you know, we're, we're, we're very, very tight on who we want to hire. We're only hiring 10 guys. And I was out of like 5,000 people. Yeah. I was number two. Right. So, I mean, I, I did really, really well on everything, but unfortunately my past caught up with me. Um, and I was angry. I was bitter. And again, like, Oh, what am I going to do? Like, uh, this is all I kind of put my eggs in this one basket, but it, it, in a way, like I just kept telling myself that something is out there for me. I don't know what it is yet, but just keep believing in the process. Yeah. Right. This isn't the product. This is the process. And sure as shit, man, like the, I, I was always at Randy's gym, started there in 2007. I didn't know where, kind of where I was going to climb to, but I was always there. I was, it, the, the, the product was always in front of my face. Right. I just never knew what it was going to be. And lo and behold, it was, it was extreme couture. Well, and what's great about that too is Vegas at the time is going through the great recession. Mm. And so to hear that, and that's where, like, even right now, right? right, We're in this pandemic, and you're talking about some of the athletes. You know who's coming to the gym, who's putting the extra hours on. You know. So before fight night even comes, you know who's put in the time. 100%. And, and so, and, and I love that you're sticking to that, and you're a product of that. And I'm, mm. I'm sure you probably coach that. You're like, listen, here's my story. You know, when, when people talk to me about, you know, I've been in real estate for almost 20 years and they go, well, have you always been in real estate? I'm like, dude, this is all I know. This is, this is all I'm good at. Right. And and so, and I said, but it wasn't always this way. I said, I had my recession before the recession. Right. And I think people need to understand, like there's a personal side. And and I think I've shared it a couple of times on this, on the show is, um, you know, for close friends, they know what happened to me and they know, like I, I had like 12 deaths like that in six months and, you know, I had to grow up. I was, I was young. I'm a, I was a young heart and it made me grow up. But to hear that same thing, I love hearing about that, Eric, because that's what people are like, oh, they look at Eric now and they're like, oh man, look, he's, he's cornering for Francis Nagano. He's having dinner with Francis. I'm like, Dude, this is decades and decades of work. Of grinding. Yeah. 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 And, and that's what everyone thinks is like, oh, I'm just going to wake up one day and just be as good looking as Adam. I'm like, no, you got to, <laughs> you, you got to work at that. You got to work at that. You, you know? know, you got to, you got to take pride in shaving yeah. your legs. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I think you hit it on the head. You know, it's, it's trust in the process, right? Yeah. Um, believing that there's something out there for you. And when you set those goals and almost kind of just, understanding that the that the that what's in front of you might not be what's meant for you right now right but just keep on grinding in that all of a sudden man like the, the dominoes just start falling You're like oh shit well hey man here's where i belong this is what i'm this is what i'm meant to be you know yeah my dad was always a coach and 
my uncle was always a coach. I was always around coaching. And I thought, well, I can always coach football. And I did for a little bit. You know, I was coaching a little football. Um, but was it like my passion, what I loved? Yeah, I did. I liked it. But right away when I started feeling like I had a, a, a platform in MMA, man, I just ran through that wall. Like, all right, this is it. I'm kicking this door down and I'm going to find a, I'm going to find a, a livelihood from the sport. Yeah. So, so who's the first guy you've coached in MMA? Well, so I, I started cornering. Um, the well, first I, I, I guess my question, I apologize. I, you start working out there. Mm-hmm. How do you get from there to trainer, I guess? So it, it's really a lot of matter of circumstances. So one of my coaches, Dennis Davis, he's still there. He's the head coach. Um, he's one of my, one of my best guys I've ever been around as far as like helping me and, and grooming me along in the sport. Uh, he was still fighting and he's like, Hey man, I need you in my corner. Um, and I think a lot of times too, when, when people think about coaches in the corner, they think about specialty coaches, all jujitsu boxing, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, and sometimes really fighters just need to be comfortable. Right. That's, that's what I thought. I thought it was, yeah. it was who can you grapple with and then who's going to look good on TV, like right before right. when you're doing the hugs. Right. That's what's important. And, and, and sometimes it is and, and really like even at this highest level, Sometimes it's a guy that's like, man, I went to school with this guy and he just makes me laugh at the times I know that I need to laugh, right? Mm-hmm. It's sometimes that's just the, the feeling that you need to have. And maybe it's not anybody that's super extra special. And that I feel like that's where I was at at the time for Dennis. I just gave him a sense of security that I would tell him the right things when he needed to hear it. And that kind of got my foot in the door. And as the sport started to grow and as my skill set started to grow, I felt like I started to be able to understand coaching more. And I started coaching at the gym. I was the first year I was in, I was a student. My first year in, Randy gave me a coaching position. I was coaching one grappling class a week. That was it. And my one grappling class a week had the had the highest number. I had I was averaging anywhere to 15 to 20, whereas the rest of the classes were like eight. And it wasn't because of experience or I knew more. I think it was just my energy levels and my motivation and what I was trying to coach and the way I was trying to coach resonated with a lot of the guys, you mm-hmm. know, and a lot of the girls. Like everybody's like, hey, man, my class is extra fun or I was putting extra work in or just the way I would approach it. So that right there started to show me, well, I have a platform. I have an area of where I can start and improve. Um, and then Ray Cepho. He gave me my really my first big opportunity. Ray Cepho was fighting for World Series of Fighting. Um, I was coming in as a training partner for Ray. You know, I'm, I'm like 225. Ray's a big heavyweight, but there's not a lot of big heavyweights in the gym, so I can give Ray some some ground looks and some wrestling looks. And uh, Ray's like, shit, man. You know, I think I want you to be be my head coach. And really, Ray gave me my big first opportunity as a head coaching job. Nice. I coached I coached and cornered Martin Campman was my first UFC that I've ever cornered. Um, and then followed suit with Brad Tavares and started falling in line that way. But Ray really gave me that first opportunity to sit down and break down film and show him some stuff and like, hey, here's what I think we should do and make a game plan together. And he's like, man, I've never done this before. Here's a guy with 100 fights, you know. He's like, I never sat down and did a game plan. I was like, well, here's where football and MMA started to blend, right? Well, mm-hmm. you never watched tape? No, I never watched tape. I never fought the guy. <laughs> Well, shit, like, why don't we get a look at the guy first? And yeah, see how he does. Right? No, no, I don't do that. You know, I just go in there and go in and do my thing. Well, that's that that is that that's the way a lot of guys still to this day. I broke down tape with Jorgen DeCastro today. He's like, oh, I've never sat and broke down tape. It's 2020. Yeah, you know, right? it's 2020, man. A lot of guys still don't do it to this day. So it was really Ray. Ray Sefo gave me that opportunity and Dennis Davis. And that's what really kind of got me in. And then, you know, it was just a snowball effect. Dude, that's awesome, man. So uh, where did you find Francis at? <laughs> so I want to know that story. Yeah. So Francis, I mean, he's kind of like that unicorn, right? Right. <laughs> um, he, I'll say. Yeah, he moved, he moved to Vegas uh, a few years back. And, you know, um, his English wasn't very good. He was very standoffish from what I remember him being. And I'm not really that guy. I'm very, hey, what's up, man? How are you? Mm-hmm. And uh, I'm not trying to take you away from anything like i'm not trying to steal you from a coach i'm not trying to um win you over i'm just trying to be me you know and and i think that's where our relationships kind of started to blossom where he would come to the gym and i didn't expect anything out of him you know and every once in a while i'd see him do something and i would give him a little bit like hey man i'm seeing you do this take it for what it's worth maybe you should try this he's like "Eh, okay you know and then sure as shit like 
we started to build that relationship and build that rapport. And then, um, you know, he would, here's a day where, uh, you know, he didn't have a round. So, hey, man, let me give you a round. Well, nobody wants to give Francis rounds, right? <laughs> right. So I'm like, fuck it. Let's go. <laughs> Glove up. I give Francis a round. Of course, I get I get the shit beat out of me. It's Francis Ninganu. But I think just being, being willing to step up there and be like, dude, I'm here for you. And then even if it's not a sparring round, maybe it's a pad round. You know, hey, you don't have a round right now. Let me help. Let me hold a couple round. Let me hold this round for you. Yeah, I'll, hold the pads. yeah, I'll go with the pads. Yeah, I'll go yeah. with the pads. The for bigger sure. the better. Right. Yeah, yeah. Right. yeah. So, I'll, I'll take the six. But I'll I, take the eight, twelve inch pad, please. One, hey, and that guy, man, I'll tell you, when he hits you, I'll tell you, it's something else. <laughs> so, he hits hard, huh? He hits hard, man. He's the hardest, hardest hitting guy I've ever ever held pads for or been hit by. Is it is it upper body or is it the whole package? How does he hit you? Um, so you know what I'm talking about? Like, you yeah, one hundred percent. Like some guys, it's all in that hip motion. And then other guy, I mean, he just looks like a phenom, right. you know? Well you, well, you hit it on the head, Eric. A lot of it is, is you, I think when we first got Francis or you started seeing Francis, a lot of his power was carried just by, by just throwing the punch. Yeah. Right? And then over the last few years, what we worked on quite a bit was the kinetic energy and loading, like even inertia. It's like, hey, I'm I'm going to hit you with my back hip. I'm going to sit down on all these punches. And then it got even harder. Right? Oh, man. Yeah. So, um, you know, I started helping him out when he fought um, his – let me think when it was. Oh, it was Curtis Blades. So he moved uh, He moved over to Extreme Couture when he fought Curtis Blades. He, he still had the guys that he was working with as, as coaches, but he was training at our gym. So we were giving him coaching advice through there, and then he would use these guys as his corner. And then Junior Dos Santos, he said, hey, man, I want you in my corner. I said, cool, I'm already out there anyway. I'm cornering Emily Whitmire. Let's do it. It's great. And it just really fit in from there. And then uh, this last fight with Jarzinho, he's like, dude, you know, I, I love the vibe. I love everything you've been showing me. I want you to be my head coach. Let's let's run this camp and let's go get this title. I said, let's go. Let's do it. So that was really it, man. Like we just really just started to kind of almost just, just slowly put myself out there. But I prefer it that way too, Adam. Like I don't want to just force myself on a guy like, oh, hey, man, you and I yeah, should yeah, work yeah, together. Yeah, yeah. It needs to be organic. And I think that's where him and I kind of just really hit hit it hit it off was, hey man, why don't you come over for dinner and meet the family? Oh, cool. Comes over, eats dinner. Yeah. Nicest guy you're ever gonna meet. My kids absolutely love him. Um, my he loves my kids. He's the nicest dude in the world you're ever gonna meet. It's so crazy because you see the go, guy go fight. You're like, holy shit. Yeah. And then him and my son are like best buds. That's you awesome. Know? So he's got the biggest heart in the world, but he's the he's the baddest dude on the planet at the same time. You know? Yeah. So, so how many guys are you coaching right now? Oh, a lot. Huh? Dude, it seems like everybody. Yeah, I got a lot of guys. I got a lot of guys. So I, I stay busy. Um, so you know, how do you break that up? Like, 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 show that attention. Like, like what you were saying, it, it has to be organic, and I right, agree, a hundred percent. So to give that time to say Francis or Danny or or whoever mm -hmm. or, or any of your guys, you want to give that full attention of, mm -hmm. if if whatever you're working on. How do you do that, man? It, it feels like you'll be pulled in a hundred different directions. One million percent right. And I think for me in 2018, um, I was gone almost every other weekend, maybe maybe gone more than I was home. And I, I, I remember telling my wife, I'm like, hey, look, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hit this hard. I'm going to get my name out there. I'm going to go win a world title. And I did. Lance Palmer, me and Lance Palmer went and won the PFL title for a million dollars. Um, I also had Vinny Magalesh in that same tournament. It could have been two. We didn't we didn't win that night. But I had two guys in the finals for the million, and we got a world title. I was cornering a lot. I was traveling a lot. <clears throat> I, don't know, I was getting my name out there, you know. So I think that was very important for me. Once that was over, um, and Lance took very good care of me, and I had some money put away, and I kind of got my name out there, I started really slowing it down and picking and choosing because he nailed it on the head. I'll give everybody 100%, and I'm never going to show up to a practice and do that shit half ass. I just mm -hmm. can't. I'm not built that way. Um, but again, like, I felt like I was starting to just, like, really just, man, die out. And what starts to pull away, right? Give and take. Yeah, yeah. Your home, your home life, your family. Oh, yeah. You know, um, missing birthdays, missing daddy daughter dances. Oh, yeah. Um, you know, uh, my mom or my sister would be like, hey, you alive? You know, where I, I would be in very much constant communication with my family and, and then I started seeing like that started to suffer. So I was like, look, I'm gonna take I'm gonna take a, some time off. I'm gonna start picking and choosing the guys I want to work with, right? Who motivates me? Who makes me want to get up in the morning and go fucking hard? Right? Mm -hmm. And if there's not if you're not on that list, dude, if you're just kind of an 
eh, okay guy, cut. Now, if you make me feel like a Dan Ige, right? Yeah, yeah. Dan Ige makes me wake, wake up and go like, hey, we're going to go hit this motherfucker, right? I'm keeping him. Yeah. Francis Ngannou, this dude wants to win a world title. I'm keeping him. Yeah. Jeremy Kennedy, he's ready to go work today. I'm keeping him. Had nothing to do with like status. Like there was dudes that were up there that I'm like, this dude. His heart's not in it. Heart's not in it. Yeah. I don't feel that shit. I don't want to be a part of it. Right. I want to be a part of greatness. So that's where I started slowing it down, picking and choosing. And again, I'm kind of back into that where I'm getting, I have a lot of fighters. Um, I'm slowly kind of picking up more and I'm slowly dropping it again, mm -hmm. almost kind of in that cycle. But I have my core that I really like, all right, man, here's where we're going to go and we're going to go get after it. So that organic feeling goes both ways. It does. Yeah, the fighter needs to trust you, but you need to trust the fighter also. One million percent. Yeah, that's interesting. I, they are the hiring. They are the ones that do the hiring. They're the employer. I am the employee technically, right? But I feel like I've built a product now that speaks for itself. I feel like, you know, I, I've been rated by a lot of different journalists to be the top five and the top five uh, of the MMA coaches. Mm -hmm. And that list always changes. And, and there's about two or three guys that I know that are ahead of me that I, I, I consider big brothers, Henry Hoof, John Crouch, Trevor Whitman, Dwayne Ludwig, guys that I always, Dude, those really are household love, names, household <laughs> names. And I'm right, I'm right there. And I always try to, I always want to keep those guys ahead of me and above me in my mind. Cause I always want somebody to chase. Yeah. Right. I never want to be like, oh, I'm on top. Cause I don't want motherfuckers trying to catch me either. Right. Yeah. 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 But that's just it, man. Like I, I, I'm always picking those dudes brains when Henry who's in town, I go take him out for lunch. We go get coffee. I try to pick his brain. Right. What are you doing? How are you doing this? Why are you doing this this way? Because Henry doesn't have an ego, right? Henry's not like, Oh, mine, mine, mine. The best, the best compliment I ever got was from Henry where he said, Hey, one day when I retire, I want to, I want to hand this over to guys like you. Right. So those things and those guys, I'm always trying to stay one step, one step ahead of, but also stay behind, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just trying to just keep, stay grimy and stay energized. It's that motivation. It's that motivation, for yeah. sure. Fantastic, man. How, how often does Randy still come to the gym? Oh, he's in all the time. Yeah, he's in all the time. For a while there, he, he was gone because he was doing a lot of movies and stuff. Yeah. But now he's in quite a bit. Um, I actually was able to get Randy in to help me out with Francis. A lot of the camp during COVID because, I mean, dude, during COVID, it was 14 weeks and it was just me and Francis and Coach yeah. Dewey. And that was it, really. I mean, I had a couple of select sparring partners. Do, does Francis in. have a ground game? Oh, dude, he's nasty. I'm telling you, we've been working on this thing. He never gets to that point. Never so you never, that point. You, you, you have no idea. You, you know, have no idea. And and I don't, you don't want to get close because yeah. you're going to get clipped. Yeah, and right. Good night. I'm, I'm telling you, we sat and we went to dinner and. I asked him, I said, hey, and it's a phrase that I like to use. I go, I go, who or, or what is your boogeyman? Yeah. He's like, well, what do you mean? I was like, well, what scares you? That's what's, what's under the bed that scares you in the fight game? He's like, man, my cardio, you know, like a steep A fight. I feel like my cardio let me down and I, you know, I felt like I could win that fight, but I, I went too hard and I blew my load and then, you know, I was getting taken down left and right. And then you could see it in his eyes, man. Like, yeah. And it, that, that he wanted to write that wrong. I said, so what happens when you make that boogeyman your bitch? And he's like, nothing's going to stop me. <laughs> yeah. And I said, so let's double down on our weakness and make that our strength. Yeah. Let's stop with not, it's not, not hit pads. Let's hit pads. Let's focus on the things that we still do really well, but let's double down on what we're not doing well. Right. And watch what happens. Well, right. And I think that's a, as a coach, I think that's what takes you to the next level because it's just like in management. So if you can help someone grow out of their weakness, you've accomplished something great. Like that's the greatest thing. So Adam coaches a lot of baseball. Mm. I've coached a lot of different sports. And when you see that person go from, Hey, I can't even hit a ball to, you know what? I'm hitting the ball every single time. Every single coach, if we got them in here, they'd tell you that's the number one piece of joy. Right. And, you know, like what you talked about, you know, make it your, you know, you will dominate that bitch, right? Right. And and so when you do that, that I, I think that's probably, I mean, I always felt like that as a coach was like, hey, I just accomplished something. For sure. And use that same analogy in, in football or in baseball that if – 
if Francis Naganu was the whole entire defensive lineup, right? He's the catcher, he's the pitcher. And yeah. where's your weakness? Oh, my weakness is in right field right now. Or my weakness is my defensive line, right? So you got to cover those holes up. All the time. Right? You're hiding this kid or you're hiding your defensive <laughs> yeah. line or you're putting one in the A gap because your fucking nose tackle sucks, whatever, right? So we don't want to hide any more weaknesses anymore, right? I don't want to hide that shit, man. Like, yeah. Like everybody thinks and knows because you had one fight with Stipe and he ended up taking you down and winning the fight that that's it that that's what you're that that is who you are i go don't ever let somebody else's perception become our reality that's not who you are it's not how we're gonna be we can fucking change that right now so in the back what we do when nobody sees when the lights and cameras aren't on us we work on yeah and we fucking grind on and then when all of a sudden now all of a sudden you start wrestling dudes or somebody shoots in and you defend a takedown and we re-wrestle or we re-shoot and put them on their ass. It's over. It's fucking over. And yeah. I'm telling you, and I, I, I don't like talking a lot about it because what he's doing to guys on the ground, they're not getting up. And I'm telling you, I've seen it. I've seen world Sambo champs that we brought in that he's <laughs> flaring their feet, flaring their feet in the air. I look at him one time. He gets this guy, flares his feet on a double. He looks over at me, and I go, don't slam him. Just like you would tell your kid, don't shit on the floor. And he yeah, just right, goes, yeah. bam, <laughs> slams yeah. this guy. I'm like, God damn it, Francis. And he gets on top of these guys, and he's mauling them. And they cannot get up. Just wait. I'm telling you, it's going to happen. We're excited. He wanted to take down Jarzinho. He wanted to take him down because he wanted to get to this out of the way. Point. Yeah. He wanted to prove a point. I said, hey, look, if it presents itself... You'll know it's there. If you force it, that's when you're going to get in trouble. Right. If it's there, great. We're going to we're going to lead off with this combination. It's called the one body. It's a high low jab to an overhand. And if that's there, if your shot's there, or if he bails, you have a head kick, you have a shot, or you have your hook. And he went with the hook, and the guy went out. Twenty yeah. seconds. We get done. Best line ever. We get done with the fight. Francis comes over. He's like, Ah, sorry, coach. I meant to throw th whatever yeah. this. I'm like. The guy's fucking still knocked out. Yeah. <laughs> like, it's fine. You did your job. We're, it, and everything went great. So then, you know, he's one of the best athletes I've ever been around. We joke around about trying to get him a tryout for the Raiders. You know? Yeah, right. <laughs> you know, he's a hand in the ground defensive end. <laughs> Easily. Or a tight end. Whatever. He can't catch for shit, though. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Awful. No, no hands. Awful hands. Clay hands. <laughs> Where's so. he from? Uh, he's from Cameroon. Cameroon, Africa. Yeah, wow. He's there right now. He's at home right now. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, uh, fight was over. He spent about another month in Vegas. We we cleaned up some training, did a lot of work, just just fun stuff. You know, you're not camp oriented stuff. Hey, we're gonna work on some switch steps and some mixed leads and things of that sort. And then he went home. Um, so he's gonna get back. I think Stipe and DC fight on the fifteenth. Yeah. Um, and we're, once we figure out how that landscape kind of you know happens. Yeah, yeah. I think there's a good chance. Uh, if Stipe wins, he might retire. You know, we yeah. don't know what's going to happen. I know Francis wants another shot at Stipe. Well, uh -oh. Stipe is yeah. complaining right now about the ring sizes. He feels like the ring size that they're going to have to fight in is is too small. It's way small. You put Francis in any ring, it's too small. <laughs> I'll tell you what, yeah, it's, it's going to be. There's nowhere to run. <laughs> yeah, right. Well, it seems like so for so. Let's talk about the game on a high level. So it seems like there's actually more fights being produced out of the UFC? Are they just trying to take advantage of the market share? You know, because right now you've got, I mean, just barely one, one you know, a couple of days out of the week, you have major league baseball showing up. If, mm -hmm. if, the, if, if there's enough people to play. Right. And then you've got, <laughs> you've got golf on, on, you know, like once a month. And like, I was even watching volleyball when a, uh, a guy I know who's our age mm -hmm. actually still plays professionally. So I was watching that. I mean, like, and I'm like every. I think every guy's like that. It's like, is there something I can watch right now? And and I know for a long time, even ping pong it, yeah. it was going on in Asia, and that was being the biggest thing bet on. And I'm like, these people have never touched a ping pong paddle before, and they just, have no idea. Just want action. Yeah. yeah, yeah exactly. And so, but it seems like there's way more fights going on right mm -hmm. now. And uh, I think. I think UFC saw an opportunity and they jumped on it. Yeah. And, and like right now, like, like that was going to be one of my questions is like, what's it like fighting with no fans or anything like that? You know what I mean? Like, mm -hmm. I'm sure you've been in, at the ring where it's packed. 
jacked, mm-hmm. screaming loud, mm-hmm. can't even hear Crazy. yourself think. And now it's almost like being in the gym. 100%. Right? Yeah, exactly. Just like it. And 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 right now... Is it, that better or, or worse? worse. Yeah. I, I like... I, it's, it's funny because somebody had just asked me that and I don't notice it a whole lot because um, when you're in there, it just fucking... Phew, tunnel vision you know yeah. you just oh, yeah. get in and you're in and you're in your 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 voice and i know like danny gay and myself it doesn't matter if there's forty thousand people he knows he hears me and you understand that voice will always cut through i can always hear coach fallis you know i can always hear that voice and there's always somebody that i always know that that voice is going to hit me um now it's a lot of gamemanship right so i'll call out codes that aren't shit just to just to throw fucking curveballs the other way. Yeah, because they can hear you now. They can hear me now. Um, what I did a lot in the Jacksonville cards is I politicked to the judges more. Oh, I I really did, and and I felt I found a an area where I'm like, okay, the judges can hear me, so I'm going to use one of my corner guys to always hype up what we're doing and use certain terminology or verbiage that's going to resonate to us winning that little exchange. Yeah. Right? So I might coach corner man number two. You're going to politic. Here's the words that we want to use. Here's the situations that we really need to use them in. Right? Yeah. Um, and I felt like it I feel like it worked against Ed, Edson Barboza. You know? Yeah. We won the fight. So, um, and a lot of that we did, we practiced. Um, and we made sure to, to, to you know, when I always had a, coach always said don't show up to the game with jelly on your face come prepared yeah and and that was a thing that i felt like we well, had is the henry doing on. that or we're, is or is this because like as all three of us have played football right and so listening to a football or baseball game dude that's that's i mean at baseball if you're not cheating you're not yeah you're just not getting caught yeah right as what the houston <laughs> yeah. astros would say yeah, yeah. 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 is but and so yeah, it, don't get me started on that. Okay. But so on a professional level, that's what you're doing. Mm-hmm. And and so what I heard you say earlier was, dude, guys wouldn't even look at tape. And like as an athlete, you're like, why give yourself the best advantage on every opportunity? Everything you can possibly do. There's so much information out there. And if you're not taking advantage of it, in my opinion, you're 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 a step behind. Yeah. And there's things that like you're conceding already. Yeah, for sure. And like Tyson Chartier, good friend of mine, cornered against him with Calvin Cater, right? <laughs> He's a really good friend of mine. Yeah. And and we it's never been done before. No, no MMA publication has done this. They sat myself and Tyson down after the fight. And we broke down the fight together as coaches in front of a media guy. It's never oh, wow. been done before. No nice. coaches have ever done that. And some of the stuff that we went back and forth with, I'm like, ah, oh, fuck. All right. Like it was, man, we just played chess again. Like yeah. we just played chess again. Yeah. Right. And, and it was things that he was telling me that he saw us doing. And then like, I had a call that I know, I didn't know anybody knew the call or heard me call it. He goes, yeah. Hey, is Iowa takedown? I'm like, oh, fuck. You know, and then I was like, hey, when you say show me something, is that your low kick? He goes, yeah, fuck. I didn't know. You know <laughs> I mean, that's how extensively we break down our tape. So you're showing the cards after the pot is already. Yeah. Hey, after I won the pot, right. this is what the cards but, look like. But really only so much because we might fight him again. Yeah. You know, we yeah. might fight him again somewhere down the line. But it, it's a great question. And it's very interesting. Just the psychology behind not having the fans in there and feeding off that energy, right? Yeah. It's very different. It's very or the different. pressure. Or the pressure. It can go both ways. One million yeah. percent. You know, like fighting at home. You see guys like, uh, I remember um, Gustafsson fighting in Sweden and fighting um, Anthony Johnson. And I loaded up on Anthony Johnson, right? Yeah. Why? Because... Here's a guy fighting at home, putting his country on his shoulders. You hear the interviews. He's like, oh, this is so big for me and my country and so much, blah, 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 blah. Yeah. All the pressure in the world was on Gustafsson. Right. Anthony Johnson could have fucking flown in, done nothing, starts the guy and, and won. Yeah. Right? All the pressure was on this man. Nobody, yeah. No, no, it wasn't on, on Anthony Johnson. Nothing. Not at all. But now, it's not like a lot. You walk in, it's just crickets. You hear you walk out That's music. That's crazy. It's nothing. But I like what you said. Like you're adapting to your situation. I have to. So now they can hear you. Judges can hear you. It, it, it's a whole new game. A whole new so, game. So now you got to kind of rethink how you're coming in. How do you how do you take advantage, or are are or are you not taking advantage of these situations? Yeah. I know when I'm in the blue corner, there's going to be a judge directly to my right. When I'm in the red corner, there's going to be a judge directly to my left and to my right on the sides of the cage, cage panel. The the commentators are going to be here mm-hmm. off on the red corner. I know that Mick Maynard, blah, 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 blah. Like, I know who's sitting by me, right? And I know where they're at. And I know 
a lot from you know. 13 can you years. hear the announcers too? Yeah, you can hear them. And so that's got to be playing in too, because now you're hearing their perception of the game. That would be wild. One hundred percent. Yeah, and so do the fighters. Yeah. Right. Like DC called out something. Oh. And DC said something, and the fighter actually responded to what DC said, and it, yeah. was, it was something wrestling, and it actually helped the kid. Yeah. You know, so he's commentating the fight. He's calling it how he sees it, but the kid heard it, and he actually used it to to counter <laughs> counter a takedown. See, that would be wild. So that you know. You should mention that because I think if they had, uh, you know, like Major League or like even Red Zone, right? Red Zone mm-hmm. NFL does the same thing. They, you know, they'll mic up different. You have the different perspectives. Right. And so to see that play out, you know, in that kind of six, you know, you have the six different views. Right. That would be that would be phenomenal because so, you know, as a as, as a fan and as a consumer of the product, you know, when we see that and DC calls it out and, and then DC goes, oh, I can't believe you did exactly what I told him. You know, during the big fights, that's, it's just crazy. You're like, oh, I hope, you know, it's just crazy. But now to know that it's like, you know, it's a whisper game now. For sure. Yeah. And I don't know if there's anything like it. I mean, for me, it's it's that, that bottom of the ninth, you know, bases loaded, that whole scenario yeah. is getting in there and, and cornering a guy like in the, with the, with the elements, right. With the f- crowd and the pressure, I fucking love it, dude. I love, mm-hmm. There's nothing like it. There's nothing like it. Like, especially with Dan, with Dan Ige, you know, we, we, he, he's always in not necessarily close fights, but for some reason, I always feel like we always have to win around three. And you always <laughs> got to come up with something. You always got to find a way to motivate yeah. him. And there's nothing like it. Like, in football, I wanted to be the, the last guy to touch the ball. I wanted to swing the bat last. I wanted to shoot the last shot. And I always want the opportunity to be able to go in and make and an win adjustment the game. and win the game. Yeah. And like, th- I don't have that opportunity now because I'm not the guy competing, but I have a pathway to do it, and that's through my fighters with our creativity and the way we can speak to them and get in. There's nothing like it. I, I love it. And, and that's what I miss is that electric energy for sure. Like mm-hmm. people yelling at how bad you suck or they want you to win or, or yeah. that's what I miss most about the fans, you know, for sure. Is that it just, it's electric. It feels that way. There's nothing like walking out of a fight with, when Francis Naganu has a Mike Tyson effect to him, right? Yeah. There's a hush over the crowd when that dude walks out, right? But the energy is insane. There's nothing that you, they're not screaming. They're not yelling. They're all like, Oh shit. I'm in awe. That's yeah. him. Yeah. That's that dude, and you can feel it. You can yeah. feel it. There's nothing like it. That's you know? awesome. And he was, and in Jacksonville, he was just snapping his fingers as he was walking out. I never seen anything like it. Like we walk out. I think I have video of it. And they line up Jarzino to go to the tunnel and walk him through the tunnel. And Francis is over here, and they they cue him up over kind of this side. And that's the first time they locked eyes. And I see Jarzino go like this and look over and look at Francis. And then look away and look back again and look away. And I was like, oh, this dude's shit in his pants right now. Like, and there's yeah. Francis, just big old smile on his face. You know? Yeah. There's no crowd. There's no nothing. It's just like a serial killer coming in to get you, man. <laughs> it's nuts. It's nuts. You so, know there's nothing you can do. Yeah. Nothing. And then you hear that cage door just clink. <laughs> oh, man. man. That's yeah. wild. It's crazy. You know, there's a silver lining with this whole pandemic that I think the UFC's done right is I think they're getting 10 times more views Killing. than ever before yeah. because people want their sports. And and right now, baseball's kind of wishy-washy. Basketball, I love basketball, and I, I'm i not trying to make a political thing. You don't love basketball? I do like basketball. Are you like, serious? The NBA? You like it a, a little bit. They're getting way too political. Right. People, even if you support it, right. people don't want to mix their politics with their sports. If you mm-hmm. want to watch sports, I want to watch my sports. For sure. Yeah. When it's time for politics stuff, they're going to tune into something and, and support mm-hmm. their politics. That's mm-hmm. all fine and dandy, but don't mix the two. Mm-hmm. And I think the NBA is doing too much of that right, right now. Way too much mm-hmm. of it. And they're losing views. Yeah. They're losing views. And I think a lot of people are coming to fighting. They're going to come over and they're going to watch that where they thought that boxing was almost done and MMA is kind of on the edge. Now, all of a sudden this happens. And well, I think, too, is as a fan, you want to know that, hey, I count. Right. You, I count. And so UFC is all about 
the fan experience. They're right. like, hey, you want more fights? Great. We're going to put more fights on. We're going to figure out a way to do it. We're going to figure out a way to do it. And so whereas, you know, the NBA is, you know, what's great about basketball, why most people like basketball is why? Because you can actually know the players. Right. And so that's where the UFC is doing phenomenal. They're like, hey, you want to get to know our athletes? Here's our Instagram. Here's our live interviews. Right. Yeah. Here's, you know what? We'll move to ESPN. I know you're on ESPN. You know, here's how this grew up. This is how this, you know, and it's real. Whereas a lot of like even so we're going to try to get a, a football player on and that got drafted by the Detroit uh, Lions. And, you know, if you don't know someone personally, like earlier we talked about our friend Deshaun. Right. And I grew up with Deshaun. And and, and so I know Deshaun Deshaun. Like I know mm-hmm. him personally, like and. A lot of people are like, well, I don't really don't know a professional athlete is the UFC does a really good job. And it, and this is they're really taking advantage of this opportunity to go, hey, here's Danny. Here's Francis. Here's you know, this is them at home. This is them like they're not sugarcoating and not right. filtering the real genuine. So you're like and so I think that's where UFC is like, hey, listen, here's our product. Right. And we fight for real. Yeah. Right. And. My kids love WWE like any other kid should, mm-hmm. right? <laughs> and you know, and my young my youngest loves WWE, you know, and you know, and that's not real fighting. It is real injuries, but it's not real fighting. But UFC is the is that difference between they've, they've the done sh- a good job of like humanizing the fighters. Yeah, you start to yeah. understand their backstory, and I think that's important. Yeah, you know, I think it's important to understand, especially from the female ele- element. A lot of the female fighters that I have, they didn't really come up fighting because they had a good upbringing, you know, and their stories, some stories need to be told and understand how they, how they got in the sport. Right. And then it, it, you kind of put a story to the face in the name. So yeah. I think it's, I think it's important. Um, and you know, I, I sent Dana a text after Jacksonville, just tell him, thank you, because I was able to make money during this time. And a lot of people weren't. You know, yeah. and, and I was very appreciative of the fact and I was glad that we were able to put a product out there for some people uh, during a time when a lot of people are hurting, you know? Yeah, for sure. So it was, for one, thank you. Like, you know, I was allowed to make some good money. You know, I made some good money in Jacksonville and all year it's been nice, you know? Yeah. And, and and in a time when it's been really tough on a lot, so. And I think that's where the fans relate to fighting, period, is this year as a, as America, as the whole world, do we've been kind of knocked down. Yeah, for we've sure. been hit right in the face with this crap. Mm-hmm. A lot of people lost jobs, small businesses have closed. It, it, it has just been nasty all the way around. But then when they watch a fight, they they may not be in the ring, mm-hmm. but they can relate to the fight. Correct. Because sometimes life is a fight. One million. Percent. And 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 these people who have lost their jobs are trying to rebuild, or sometimes are looking for new jobs, a whole mm-hmm. new career. Mm-hmm. And and when they are. They're able to watch that fight. I don't know. Maybe they feel like they're in that ring because that's what their life feels like right now. Great Everyone point. keeps punching me in the face. Right. Is that guy going to – no, that's how yeah. people feel right yeah, that's, now. That's I mean, great point. I, the, the entertainment business here in Las Vegas, I can't imagine what those people are going through. Right. I mean, the bartenders, the waitresses, all of those people, a lot of Musicians. them – Musicians. Yes. I mean, I, I – You know – Acrobats. Yeah. They're looking the whole- for new work or they're gonna relocate and go somewhere else. Go somewhere else. And and so fighting is that one thing that it's like, you know, I don't know. Even if I'm not a fighter, I can relate to the fight, it, if that makes any no, sense. No, it's a great point. And I think it, it even if it just gives them a moment to disconnect from all the bullshit going on in their yeah. lives, you know, and gives them a little bit of time to kind of just turn it all off, you know, and and and, and be entertained is is a win right Mm -hmm. but i think you're absolutely right to me this whole this whole pandemic has been a lot about perception and easy for me to say man like i've been able to keep my job i've been able to still work and a lot of people have it but what i have noticed during this time is i've got to make up for a lot of lost time i got to be a a dad you know i got to be at home um i got to put my kids to bed i got to make them dinner you know um so Yes, has it been unfortunate? Uh, for sure, you know, but I'm also going to take advantage of this time the best that I can. For sure. Right? So I think, I, I hope that a lot of people understand that we were given 
something we've been throwing a curveball but it doesn't mean it can't be a home run either no no you know? and there's nothing better than a support from family at home for sure 100 percent. so do eric it's been awesome thank Hold you on, so I, much I oh you questions. guys let's go okay i got, okay. Two I got, questions. All, I got all night we're good so, now i gotta edit that part out yeah, yeah i know <laughs> <laughs> two questions so how often do guys come in and get knocked out like when they first first try it so like if someone's thinking hey you know what I've been watching MMA for years, right? Uh, we're going to have uh, Jimmy Spacuza come back yeah, in. Yeah. And and Jimmy talks about, he, on his last uh, episode, he talked about, hey, this is how I ended up. And it was the death of his father, actually. Yep. And uh, But I could just imagine you being a manager at Extreme Couture. You get, oh, these guys aren't that tough. And then, <laughs> and then 20 seconds later, what happened? Why yeah. am I on the Why am I on the mat? Get yeah. these tough guys off the street. Yeah, yeah. How, how often does that happen? Um, not as much as what it used to be. Oh, it's so sad. yeah, it, this is a sad story. But, but <laughs> we allow I allow it. But so when with, during the heyday of extreme couture, it didn't matter if you're the nicest guy in the world if you had a good attitude. Yeah. If it was your first day and you're new, you're getting the living shit beat beat out of you, and they're trying to knock you out. Right. Then it turned into like okay. Let's not knock them out and save some brain health. Let's drop them with body shots, right? <laughs> or, mm, he'll Bruises. be fine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He'll be fine after the body shots. Um, and then, you know, when I took over the gym as the gym manager and then uh, Coach Follis was in as, as a coach, we started to see it, the, the way the sport was changing. It was I didn't, wanna, I didn't want these guys to lose out on their livelihood in the room, right? Yeah. We weren't getting paid for the training sessions. And – if I can avoid some of those KOs due to the history of what I've seen, Martin Campman, right? Yeah. Gets knocked out two weeks before he fights Johnny Hendricks, then gets knocked out in the fight, right? Yeah. Guys getting dropped in rounds that didn't need to get dropped because they're having wars in the gym. All right, let's change that way. Let's change our ways, right? Let's slow sparring down enough. Not slow it down. But let's take care of each other. Right? Yeah. They don't need to be yeah. KOs in the room. Then you'll get a dickhead in every once in a while, right? Those guys, we call them the green lights, right? We'll, we'll get a guy, hey, well, this guy's, you know, 135er, 145er. I always put him with a kid that I know smaller. Hey, Pooney, he's a 125er. Hey, yeah. spar this kid. Green light's on. And then you try to take the guy's head off, right? Nice. <laughs> so, you know, we'll try to get the knockouts that way. And that's because you're being an asshole, you know, and, yeah. and, and you come in, you're, you're, I had a guy yelling at the front desk girl one time. He was this, he was that, you know, he's one of Floyd Mayweather's bodyguards. He's a fucking blah, blah, blah. Finally, I'm like, you know what? Let him in. Yeah. He didn't make it two rounds, you know, crawling off the mats, crawling off the mats. We're beating the shit out of this guy. Every, it, what's funny about that though, all the time. And, uh, I actually talked to one of Floyd's really guys and he, uh, we were talking about this. He's like, Eric. People come in, you know, people all the time claim to be in Floyd's camp. Oh, yeah, we're, I'm from, I know Floyd, I'm in Floyd's camp, blah, 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 blah. And I'm like, really? And then uh, I was talking to uh, one of Floyd's family members, and they're like, Eric, uh, yeah. They're like, it's really these four people, yeah. and everyone else are just mooches. Just it's, mooches, man. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, and I'm like, oh, that, I thought, I was like, I had a feeling I was going to call you, and, and, and sure enough, and, and I know too, like, if you have to talk about it, it probably yeah. is not true, yeah. right? And we have, a, I have a saying, and it was kind of resonated from football. Hey, don't tell me, show me. I don't need to. Yep. You don't need to tell me about it. I'll see it right away. Yeah, you're two hundred and zero in street fights. Cool, bro. <laughs> <laughs> don't tell me, show me. I'll see. I'll find out right away. Yeah. yeah. Right. This 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 gym will expose you. This town will expose you. If you come, if you move out to Vegas, and you don't, if you have a problem with drugs or alcohol or gambling, oh, um, that's what I love about this. Eat you up. Love it about this city. I love it, right? Because if you don't, if you don't have any self preservation and you can't fucking say no, chew them up and spit them out. Get yep. the fuck out of here. We'll take all your money while you're at it. Right? Yeah, right. Yeah. You know, but you know, Kevin Lee moves out here from Detroit, young kid, impressionable. He comes in. Puts it on, grinds, right? Fights for a title. He's he's one of the hardest workers I know. He understood. He understood what this town was about and what hard work's all about. You know. Then you get the guy that comes in and doesn't really get it, and 
they kind of fizzle out. You yeah. Know, you don't see them as much anymore. So if, if someone is thinking like they've, you know, you know, I think part of the story too is you didn't wrestle in high school, right? Mm -hmm. You didn't wrestle in college mm -hmm. and uh, like, like Bader, Bader was a national college. DC is a, you know, uh, is accomplished wrestler mm -hmm. is, uh, you know, you have so many stories and I think that's why like right now during this pandemic is who are the fighters, who are mm -hmm. the people who are actually succeeding is not everyone was on this wrestling path, you know, national collegiate and wrestler of the year. That's not everyone ever, you know, depends on where your heart is mm -hmm. at the end of the day. Like, do you have the work ethic? Do you have the heart? You know, you talk about that third round, the third round is, Everything that you did for the last six months, Boom. did you do the cardio? Did you run the extra mile? Did you run, you know, because it's, it's muscle memory at that point. It's muscle memory. It's muscle memory and it, it's heart. Do you, do you, do you want to pump it out? Is yeah. your heart big enough to pump it out or are you done? Are you gassed beyond, you know, like you talked about some of the fighters shooting their load. Did you really, are you done right now? Because you can find more, but you know, as a coach, you can't just hand it to him. You can't just slip yeah. him and say, Hey, this is, this is it. And so, but so if a kid is thinking, you know, you, you, you talked about when you were playing football at 14 is a lot of kids I think now are like, okay, maybe I am an MMA fighter. Mm -hmm. Maybe that is, um, I think there was, oh, who was that kid that just fought and they, they bumped him up from the minor leagues. He's like, he's like 18 or 22 tall. Edmund. Yeah. Shabazian. Did yeah. He just fought? Yeah, they just he yeah. lost. Lost to Brunson. He, yeah, lost mm -hmm. to Brunson, and Brunson's a vegetarian, and um, and but you know Brunson is he's a grinder. So he'll he'll take any fight, yeah. and um, you know this was the kid's opportunity, but I think it it probably helped him in the long run for sure. Yeah, taking those L's right now. Yeah. yeah, and so so if there's a kid in high school right now, you know especially now like. You know, maybe they graduated, maybe they didn't. I don't even know what you call that graduation, right? <laughs> yeah, right. Then they just give your daughter a piece of paper and they're like, "Good luck," right? She, she still hasn't received it yet. Oh, oh okay. So messed up, huh? Right. So you write down uh, something around <laughs> yeah. something around twenty twenty. <laughs> so, or somebody like you know what we're talking about the pandemic and people are like, you know what, this is what I want to do. Mm -hmm. How do they make that decision like you did that one day in two thousand seven and go, you know what, I think this is the door I need to open. Do they knock on extreme couture's? Do they come to the gym? Like how do they get that started real quick? Yeah, I think I think really just finding any sort of foot in the door with some part of what we do. If it's jujitsu, if it's the wrestling, if it's kickboxing and start really figuring out if this is for you, you know. I've known Jimmy Spacuza for a long time and Jimmy was just always a really great athlete. One of the best athletes that I knew. He started off really just doing a lot of jiu-jitsu. He was then, an ice skater, by the way. Yeah. If you knew, if you didn't know Adam, <laughs> but you yeah, know, he was a he was a semi-pro uh, ice skater. Ice skater, yeah. Um, but really, just you you want to you want to kind of fall in love with it, you know, and and make it a part of you, right? Don't let it just be like, oh, this is kind of what I want to do, because in this sport, kind of what you want to do is going to get you hurt. Right. And if you're going to do it, you need to be all in, you know, and, and I, I know like I, I always use the term and I always say it with my fighters. We have that phrase, burn the boats, burn the boats was something that came from my uncle that he used to always talk about Hernan Cortez, the conqueror. He goes in to go conquer yeah. the Aztecs mm -hmm. and they thought they're outnumbered and they were going to get killed. And he says, Hey, burn all these boats. We're not leaving until we conquer them and we're taking their boats home. So once you're willing to feel like this is what you're going to do, you have to burn the boats that there's no return. There's no, there's, there's no other outcome than me winning or taking this Island. Right. And that's kind of the mentality you have to have with MMA. Can't just be kind of half in half out. Cause that's where guys get hurt really bad. Final question. So right now you're one of the top five coaches at UFC in a sport that is dominating the airwaves. Are you looking at coaching? How much, how, are you looking at being a speaker at a future date? I, I thought about it. I've done. How, how soon do we get the? How how soon do we get the the Nixic training? How, <laughs> the the Nixic coaching program. Yeah, um, my wife would probably love that a lot more because I could probably stay home a lot. And just, <laughs> um, 
I, 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 for I, our listeners, I'm going to be starting the Nick Sick training program, <laughs> <laughs> and for all of our listeners, we'll offer a special discount. Right. So I, I'm always trying to self improve, me personally. Right. Um, one percent. One percent. Whatever I can do, if I can listen, if I can read, if I can do something to improve myself i feel like by doing so that inherently improves the people around me because everything that you've talked about tonight eric literally trans goes across everything right Mm -hmm. we talk about everything that your uncle says everything your dad said and that's what i love too and i think that's why we all hopefully you know that's what everyone in in, in business or in their jobs are like you know what what can i do better Mm -hmm. is is we all understand we all need a coach right and, and part of the coaching is, man, the coach can see things that I can't. Right. And, you know, we talk about a sixth sense, but realistically, your sixth sense is your coach. Right. Your coach is like, I can look back here and I can see you're not throwing the left hook. Mm. I've told you like 12 times to throw a left hook. And or, you know, you need like you talked about, what do we need to do to, to dominate your boogeyman, mm-hmm. all that stuff is so important. Even in life, even if you just have a job and you want to get better at your job or even being better at a dad, right? being better at a dude, being a husband right now, not the easiest thing, right? You know, yeah. and how do you, so you talk about managing relationships, dude, those, that's like a lot of jelly in your hand and yeah. how do you manage it? So. And, and I think, I think as, as men now and as parents and we see that, we understand that like when you just stop, hit pause and kind of look at the entire like infrastructure, what's going on in our household or in my life or in my, in my health, right? What's getting pulled in one direction or the other. And then you just go, hold on, let me start pulling a little bit more over this way. Let me, let me give a little bit more drops in the bucket, bucket over here, drops in the bucket over there. Right. Because sooner or later, you know, the wife's going to leave you because you're not putting anything in over there. Right. Or your teammates aren't happy because you're, you're you're not committed over there, and it's hard. It's hard. I found waking up a little bit earlier in the day to give myself a little bit more time. And I don't have a lot of time to work out myself. Okay, well I can get up a little bit earlier too, mm-hmm. right? I have to be a coach, but I also have to be coachable, right? I don't know everything, and the moment I feel like I know everything is when I need to quit because that's when I'm going to get guys hurt. Or I'm I'm gonna hit I'm gonna become stagnant. Yeah. So I try to keep um, like Henry Hooft. I try to keep him close. I try to keep Trevor Whitman close. Guys that I feel that I want to catch up to one day that are willing to coach me right and be there as support system. So, you know, I think that's that's important for all of us is to be coachable, to be a coach, to sit down and write out our goals, see see where we're at, find your checks and balances throughout your life, right? Right. And then reset and just get back after it again but man there's nothing better in the world for me that I, I i'm just so fortunate that i was able to find this and fighting is it, it's more to me than fighting right it's it's a it is it's a it's an ultimate chess game and i play chess every day that's what i have to explain to my wife my wife's like how can you watch that and i'm like well number one a it makes me makes me want to work out makes me want to get in shape number two is if you actually understand the game, you actually understand it's a chess match. Man, it's chess. It is not two guys. If you're just looking for two guys clobbering themselves, there's a lot of Russian channels out there. <laughs> yeah, for sure. <laughs> right? With that tag team. Yes. That Dude, that's, that's kind of fun, man. Yeah. yeah. I'm going to dig like it up. The I'm backyard brawls, <laughs> that's that's just clobbering. I'm going to find it for Adam. But I'll leave you guys with this, man. And I think that it, it's important because when I first started off in the sport, you get – labeled or you get set in a certain type of um genre let's say as a specialty coach right like oh you're a pitching coach or you're a defensive coordinator you're this you're that and i remember a coach saying those words he said well i'm a specialty coach i coach grappling and i'm like man i want to be an mma coach i want to be able to coach from the feet to the floor I want to be the guy where if we go on the road, you don't need to bring four other cornermen with you. Mm -hmm. That if I got Eric with me, that dude can wrap my hands, hold my pads, grapple, wrestle, and coach his ass off, and that's all I need, right? So if you're in any line of work, whatever it may be, it's like I want to dominate every piece of – Every field that I'm in, I want to be able to know everything about my product. I want to know everything about my company. I want to know everything about everything that I do. So if somebody got sick or somebody got hurt or somebody can't go, I can be the guy to do it, 
right? And that's where I feel like I was able to take the upper hand in my coaching was right then and there. I was like, you know, I don't want to be a specialty coach. Ray, let me start holding pads for you. Let me learn. Yeah. Ah, well, all right, I'll give you 10 minutes a day. I'll take that 10 minutes a day, Yeah. right? And I'm going to double down on that 10 minutes a day and I'm going to become good at it. Now I'm holding pads for all the best guys in the world, right? Right. Hey, man, I want to grapple with this guy, Vinny Magalesh, best grappler on the planet. Let me get rounds with you today, right? Double down on that weakness, find that boogeyman and dominate that fucker. Right on. Awesome. Eric, thanks for coming in tonight. Dude, love it. Thank you, guys. Huge, really inspiring, man. Hey, thanks for everyone for listening to the show, man. Uh, hit that subscribe button. Leave a comment. Uh, we're going to put your uh, Instagram and Facebook handles on there. Check out uh, Eric Nixick on, on the social medias. Follow him. And uh, and I'll, I'll start. I'll, I'll build out Eric's uh, uh, coaching page. <laughs> yeah, there his, you go. His uh, training pa- his uh, leadership page. So coming to a landing page near you. So. And get inspired, man. (laughs) Right on, man. Thank you. Thanks for having me, guys. Appreciate it. All right.